I do. I realize I do have a, a little bit of a bone to pick with uh, something that we said that came out of yesterday's conversation, which was this idea that uh, inquisitors, the people who are doing Catholic censorship, are like just the, the many second sons out there. There is an explicit acknowledgement when the Catholic Church begins to pursue a policy of expurgation that they need experts in mm -hmm. the field mm -hmm. to advise mm -hmm. on what content needs to stay in books and what content needs to leave. So when I tell you that I'm writing about the censorship of medical texts, I'm looking at the ways in which physicians, university educated, the best physicians in Italy are being recruited to try to participate in the in the correction of books. And this uh, they, they undermine that in a lot of ways. A lot of them aren't just like, are just not interested in uh, engaging in this process at all. But I do think that we need to realize that there is uh, uh, and, I, and I don't think that this is apologetic on behalf of the church pursuing these censorship initiatives, right? But I do think that it's important to recognize that there is a sense that there are multiple realms of expertise in the early modern period, and that the Catholic Church recognizes that uh, their expertise is fundamentally in theological matters, and that that they see that as above everything else. So whatever whatever comes up from uh, these other people who are experts, so that people at Padua, professors at Padua, who are experts in uh, medicine, people at Bologna who are experts in canon law, that those, those are input that the Catholic Church is hearing, although at the end of the day, the theologians, the College of Cardinals are the people who are making the ultimate decision. So I just, I want to uh, emphasize a little bit that there are realms of expertise that are really relevant in this early modern context as well. I don't want it to be just a, a world mm -hmm. of, of, of religion mm -hmm. that everybody has the same church mm -hmm. education, that there is an acknowledgement that there are different kinds of experts, even mm -hmm. in this early stage, right? Yeah, sure, yeah, no, sure. I think. The yeah. other thing that just Alan's point about the, the appearance of refutations out in the public, and yeah. it's such an interesting question, right? When that comes in mm -hmm. and, and why it isn't seen through in the way that it was in the 16th century. And one of the things that occurs to me as possibly relevant to that is that the nature of university training changes mm -hmm. in the 18th century. Yeah. Somewhere, depending on where you are, there's a complicated geography to this. Yeah. But prior to about 1700, when you were at university, you didn't graduate from university by doing a written exam. You graduated from university by doing a disputation. Yeah. So the whole thing is very theatrical, and it's completely predicated on the idea that mm -hmm. you are in an argument. And you have to con concoct the, the strongest possible counter argument, all of that stuff that we spoke about yeah. yesterday. Mm -hmm. That's what it was to be a university graduate, mm -hmm. was yeah. to, to, be, to master that. But in the 18th century, increasingly, you get written exams introduced, first mm -hmm. in things like classics and mathematics, and then expands out from that in the 19th century, which means that you don't get rid of the idea that it's, it's uh, you know, uh, to some extent, polemical. But it doesn't quite have that foregrounded notion that the whole thing is a head-to-head -head duel. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that may be something to do with this, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and we uh, we obviously see this kind of disputation mentality in the in the um, in the areas affected by European expansion, right? There's this famous uh, uh, there's this famous section in the diary of um, Cotton Cotton Mather. Um, mm -hmm. Where, uh, where he describes this feverish dream he had uh, um, the night before that he woke up from um, sweating. He was, he was imagining he'd had a disputation with a, uh, with a Jesuit priest, <laughs> uh, Father Raal, who was up in Maine, and he had defeated him. And so, so it finally you know, kind of knocked down his arch enemy who was hiding up in the woods, <laughs> you know, up in, uh, um, up in Maine. As a native uh, Mainer, this feels very weird. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. He was, you know, he was kind of, um, cre uh, creating all, uh, all these kind of Jesuit uh, indigenous alliances to attack the New Englanders. And so you can sort of see why Mather had this sort of interest. Um, but we, we, we also find it in other missionary contexts um, as well, and, and um, th this is tremendously useful for historians in a lot of ways, um, because say in Portuguese India, uh, we, we don't have much evidence of uh, native religious practices except from these attacks on them by mm -hmm. Jesuits, mm -hmm. who by, you know, kind of trying to tear them apart have actually preserved, um, you know, pr uh, um, preserved certain kind of, um, um, what we say, Hindu, um, Practices for posterity that were, you know, that were otherwise would have been destroyed, and there was actually, of course, a, uh, a program mm -hmm. to destroy them. Um, Too to How about a story? All right. Okay. So I've been uh, going through the papers of this uh, physician who lives in Ravenna in the 16th uh, 
end of the 16th century, well, the second half of the 16th century, beginning of the 17th century. And uh, he worked as one of these expert censors for the Roman Inquisition, for the Roman Index of Prohibited Books. That is, when the Roman Index is asking, uh, submits a call for people to uh, take part in what they call the honorable enterprise, which is censorship, uh, he steps up and decides uh, out of piety to participate in expurgating other people's books. As I was going through his papers, I also found that he then goes back over his own writings, his own manuscripts, and changes them. Sorry. Oh, no, no, it's okay. I thought it was my battery or something. There's a battery check. Uh, so he goes back and then starts censoring his own books. That We can see that we know that self-censorship happens. Like this, we know that that's one of the effects of censorship regimes. But we so rarely sort of have the material evidence of the ways that people then uh, take their pen to their own work in this period. And so I, I think one of the things that I found that's really exciting is him going back through and editing his papers mm -hmm. and removing praise of Protestant authors or reframing the ways that he puts certain um, uh, certain comments or uh, labeling her heretical authors uh, as such in the indexes of his of the of his books. So we see this process of uh, revisiting his own text. And I think something I was talking to uh, uh, with Glenn about uh, about thirty seconds ago um, is that for him this really is this this is indeed an act of piety that, that he is uh, participating from the perspective of a. Um, physician in the process of reforming Catholicism. And he sees this as an act of piety that he's performing for the public at large and the Catholic public at large with correcting other people's books and uh, on a sort of personal level in reviewing his own text. And I was sort of curious to what extent you see self-censorship as an act of, if not piety, of true belief. Uh, and, and when we should uh, see it as that versus an in, sort of in, internalized repressive process, which it also is, right? But when we can see it as really an expression of also true belief in the system. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my own experience, some of my research has looked at legal intellectuals who sort of straddle the period before the 1949 revolution in China, which means that they were trained in the nationalist period with a very Western leaning civil law tradition type of legal education and a commitment to constructing a Western style civil law legal system in China. Uh, and then the 1949 revolution happens, and these are the experts of, on law that are available to the new PRC communist government. And some of them, a great many of them, because they serve the former regime, are no longer able to participate in the legal system for ideological reasons, and so they are purged. But a small number of them are preserved, and instead of using the sources of authority that they cited before 1949, in the civil law tradition, largely Japanese or German sources, hmm. they turn to the Soviet Union as a framing device. Because the Soviet Union also is deeply embedded in civil law tradition post, you know, from the mid-1930s onward, Vyshinsky and the <coughs> post-1936 Soviet constitution. And they use that framing device to legitimate arguments that they had previously legitimated by citation to awesome. German and Japanese sources. Mm -hmm. And for a time, this works because the Soviet Union is the ideological big brother, the model by which, you know, to which China looks for what socialist modernity should be. Uh, but by the end of the 1950s, it no longer works as Mao's relationship with the Soviet Union and Khrushchev begins to become more complicated. And Mao decides that he is the true successor to Stalin and that the Soviet Union has gone off the rails. Uh, and those people end up suffering as well. Um, but interestingly, many of them outlive now, and they become a resource in the 1970s for the reconstruction of the legal system. And so this argument kind of comes back full circle, simply because of their longevity. And that becomes a, a new source of kind of a Marxist resource on which to draw. on. Fascinating. There's, there's something, um, so about self-censorship, I think one of the, the interesting things to think about is, is the, the self that's being censored. Um, and there's a sense in which I think this, this comes into a whole area of thinking about the historical sociological constitution of, of selves. What is it to have a self or be a self? And I think in the, the 16th and 17th century, there was a big literature that, it, it, that retrospectively looks like it deals with this um, on what were called the passions. And it's, in a certain sense, it's like a psychological literature before psychology. Um, and what it does is it, it goes through a series of uh, they're almost like the poses that are used in, in 17th century acting. Mm -hmm. you know, so uh, passions, I think, are, are responses that the body and the mind give to stimuli from outside you. So it's things like anger, 
uh, love, curiosity, uh, vengefulness, things like that. There's a whole, whole panoply of them. And in fact, in, in the 17th century, John Locke's treatise on education is very, very explicit about this. What education is, is a process of disciplining the passions. And the thing about the reason what I'm getting here, what I'm getting to here is that there's an interesting sort of counterintuitive sense in which self-censorship is actually seen to be essential for freedom. Because it was widely held that true freedom, the freedom of the mind, involves liberating yourself from what otherwise might be the overbearing, sort of corrupting influence of the body. Discussing the plural channels by which Jansenists and others who are forbidden to communicate uh, under particular regimes manage to, I feel I need to try to channel our co-organizer, Cory Doctorow, for a moment, who is so adamant about the fact that we are in the process now of creating the shape of the internet and what discourse can happen on the internet, and whether we're creating sort of monopole communities, you know, allowing Facebook to be the only space in which X conversation can occur, or Twitter to become the only space in which X conversation can occur, or whether the internet we collectively cultivate is going to be one with many plural, complex, competing channels. And that it's very important as this uh, matchless tool for communication is shaped by the technologies we develop, by the communities we set up, by the laws and policies we adopt, to make sure that it becomes one that has plural avenues, because when one avenue fails, then another can be resorted to. In the wake of which I feel I need to also remind you of the discussions we had when Kathleen Gallou was here talking about hate groups, and when Teresa Nielsen Hayden was here talking about online communities, that the most persecuted voices will be the first new adopters of a new channel. Whether those are Jansenists who are disagreeing with the dominant Catholicism of France, whether these are radical feminists or radical GLBT activists, whether these are neo-Nazis and hate mongers, they will be the first adopters of the alternate channel because they are the people who are having trouble communicating in the main channel and therefore it's worth it to them to face the extra effort, the extra time, the extra layers of exhaustion that come from learning to adapt to the new channel. So if we choose to create a complex and plural internet which has lots of spaces for communication as enabled the liberty of Jansenist speech in the Enlightenment. We also thereby enable the liberty of a huge range of political spectra, many of which we agree with, many of which we don't agree with. Whoever the we is, there's going to be somebody that you agree with and somebody that you disagree with described in this range of spectra, which I think is important for us to think about the structures of new information worlds. Briefly, in response to the second half, we talked a little bit earlier about you know, Adrian's question of how to cultivate a good reader. And there's a lot of focus on the idea of critical reading and critical thinking. And one of the things we really want the educational system is to be cultivating critical reading and critical thinking. But critical so often gets interpreted as criticizing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that the smart thing to do is pick the holes in the thing, uh, that the authoritative uh, movie reviewer is the one that always hates everything, <laughs> or the, the book reviewer who is really hard to please and finds the flaw in everything is the one that is smartest, most objective, most worthy of respect, right? I have graded more than 500 and undergraduate papers about why Plato is an idiot and no one would ever behave in the Republic the way he has the people behave in the Republic. I have graded maybe 15 brilliant undergraduate papers about why Plato thought people would behave that way in the Republic and the differences between Plato's worldview and Plato's psychology and our own and why he thinks this thing that to us seems wrong. That to me is the much harder kind of critical thinking, the empathetic kind of critical thinking that doesn't criticize but reads carefully, critically, prudently and with empathy and connection to try to understand the other side, which I think is, is something that doesn't just apply to the academic world, doesn't just apply to how we write a paper in a class, it applies to how we read a blog post, how we judge a New York Times article, how we, how we evaluate when someone has posted something on Twitter that they want us to hate uh, or like to hate, as Twitter often is. 
uh, whether, whether the empathetic reading, which is the really challenging critical element, is there.